with that being said, what I want to do is I want to turn things over to Dean Mike Beesing, and he's going to give us our formal welcome and introduction. So turning it over Thank to you, Mike. Thank you, Demetria. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the inaugural College of Business Diversity Council Speaker Series event. And I do want to note that uh, there are going to be other colleges within the university doing this same type of event, but we are the first out of the shoot. So congratulations to all our planners for that. Uh, this is the first of four events we are hosting this spring semester, and the topic of today's event is Creating Culture of Belonging, Part 1. Our hope with these events is to have open and honest dialogue around diversity and diversity issues as it pertains to JMU, the business world, and society in general. Through conversation, we can learn from one another on how best um, to create inclusive communities where we all feel uh, that we belong. Our panel this evening includes four individuals who, play, who will play a role in the DEI space uh, for their respective organizations, uh, three of whom are JMU graduates. Our first panelist is Brian Reeves, he is the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer of Dell. He's responsible for Dell's global diversity and inclusion initiatives. In this role, he partners with leaders and team members across the organization to deepen and advance uh, Dell's culture of inclusion as a fundamental business imperative. Brian is an experienced technology executive with a track record of success in advancing diversity and inclusion within the tech industry. Prior to joining Dell, Brian was a senior VP with, uh, in SAP's office of the CEO organization, uh, where he led diversity and inclusion initiatives for that company. While at SAP, Brian was the key innovator for two of SAP's major diversity initiatives, Project Propel, which provided trainings on the latest technologies to a variety of groups, including minority service institutions and historically black colleges and universities, and Project Dream, which aimed to increase exposure of SAP's products to a more diverse range of consumers. Brian holds a BS in mathematics and computer science from UCLA, uh, and he grew up in South Central Los Angeles area. And Tina Trumbo graduated from JMU in 1997 as a CIS major. And uh, she was in the first class that I taught at JMU, uh, by the way. After she graduated, she went into consulting at PwC and had the idea to create IT consulting class at JMU in order to prepare students for career consulting, and this has been so successful, and it's great to see her uh, back every year uh, up in Northern Virginia when we hold our annual event. Tina spent 20 years with SAP, where she most um, recently had positions, which included Chief of Staff for Success Factors uh, Services and Leader of Diversity and Inclusion for the Customer Success Board area. She has recently joined Google uh, to lead communities for customer success. Welcome, Tina. And Randall Tucker is the Chief Inclusion Officer for MasterCard, where he's responsible for expanding the company's inclusion and diversity strategy globally and aligning it more closely to supporting company-wide um, business goals and objectives. In his nearly 20-year career history before joining MasterCard, Randall led the transformation of Starwood hotels and resorts uh, diversity and inclusion strategy from a US focused model to a global model. During his tenure, he led the development of the organization's first global initiative to enhance career opportunities for women at senior levels. Uh, Randall holds a Bachelor of Arts from James Madison University, double majoring in hotel tourism management and marketing. Randall lives in New York City with his husband Raymond of 24 years. They met as freshmen at JMU uh, in their second week. Rachel Schnorr. Rachel is the Senior Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Dentsu in the Americas region. Dentsu is a global advertising and marketing company. Rachel serves in a Chief of Staff role and works with the Chief Equity Officer and other business leaders to operationalize the EI strategy and inclusion, both at the central holding company level and among uh, Dentsu's suite of brands, which also includes building partnerships with clients on mutual uh, DEI objectives. She also helps to build and engage grassroots community of DEI champions and employee resource groups. Rachel switched careers into DEI work full-time at the holding company level uh, a year ago after 13 years as a digital marketing veteran with Merkle. 
one of Dentsu's flagship brands. Rachel served uh, dually as vice president in Merkel's media practice, leading paid search department and co-lead for Merkel's America Diversity and Inclusion Council. Uh, Rachel created Merkel's DNI program and uh, garnered industry recognition, including the inaugural Microsoft DNI Champion of the Year Award for both Americas and global regions. Rachel holds a BBA degree from JMU, majoring in marketing. She has also been serving on the JMU Marketing Department uh, Executive Advisory Council since 2014. I will now turn things back over to Dr. Henderson, who is serving as moderator for tonight's event. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mike. So again, big welcome to everybody. I know some of you were joining at, as we were going through these impressive bios of all our panelists. So I just wanna say thank you again to our panelists for being here. So don't wanna waste any time. So I'm gonna start and just jump into our first question. So one of the things that, that's happening and that I see going on, especially based on the event of last summer, right? This idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion, it seems to be something that's on everybody's radar. Uh, with that being said, it seems as though sometimes there's confusion or maybe there is not clarity around what these various terms mean. Uh, and so, you know, thinking about the terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, now belonging, which is now starting to be added, added to, to that particular vocabulary. Um, what I want to do is I want to hear from, from each of our panelists in terms of how do you actually define these terms. So what I'm going to do is, uh, is I'm going to give each one of you a term and ask you to define it. So I'm going to kick off and start with Rachel and ask you to define diversity for me. How do you define that? Sure. Um, you know, I think diversity is about appreciating and welcoming difference, recognizing um, that more and different inputs create strength. Um, you know, diversity is, is something that we value. Um, and I think it's also important to think about diversity is not just a synonym for gender or race. Diversity truly is all of the different things that make us unique. Um, someone's background, their experiences, their faith, etc. And so I think Sometimes I do feel like we use the word diversity and someone is really just speaking to ethnic diversity when they say that. I think we need to be careful to really respect the term and not muddy or narrow the meaning of that word because um, that can actually work against inclusion um, when we do that. So, so that's, that's my thoughts on diversity. Oh, I, I love that. And I love the idea that you talk about the idea of oftentimes, again, when we think about diversity is sometimes just that service level diversity, but really recognizing that there is what we call that deep level diversity as well, like really understanding these various character traits and, and things that make us all unique individuals. So I appreciate that definition. So Brian, I'm going to turn things over to you. How would you define equity? Yeah, that's probably the, the, the simplest one in, in, uh, to define. I mean, it really is the fair and um, just treatment of all members of the community, uh, you know, the communities that were spoken uh, just about. Um, and I think the thing with equity, we can't uh, mix it up with equality, which is different. You know, equal equals, you know, sort of math mathematician here. But equity really is about fairness and just treatment for all members of a specific uh, set of communities. So if you don't mind, can I probe a little, little sure. into that? So you definitely sure. made a distinction between this idea of equity and equality. And I think that people definitely get those two things uh, confused. So can you maybe elaborate in terms of how maybe you would consider equality as opposed to what that difference is yeah. between that and equity? Absolutely. I think equity is a, a significant step towards equality because, you know, inequality, I mean, having, a, a, you know, in the true sense, in, in my opinion, is almost not um, believable, but everything is going to be equal to everyone. But that is absolutely a goal that we should get to, that if for every opportunity, for everything in life, we have an equal opportunity to it. Equity is, is it, it quite honestly speaks to the fact that in the world that everything isn't equal, that at least from a pro rata perspective, there should be equitable opportunity. So if you are X percentage of whatever intersection that you are, that opportunity should be to that percentage. You should be equitably, um, you know, uh, equitably able to achieve that. So I view equity as a path to equality. I think equality is a goal, but when we go towards equality, in my opinion, people just will say, well, that's impossible and it won't be there. So I think in the movement now, equity getting to equity is definitely a significant step. And then I think we can move to equality. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Randall, inclusion. 
What's your take on inclusion? So uh, th thanks for that. You know, I, I, I kind of have to make the statement that I think all of us have been in this field for a long time and have seen the words change. But I think the most important piece is that we're actually doing the work. And so I think for, for me, any of these words, belonging, equity, inclusion, diversity, they all ladder up to creating a level playing field for folks. Uh, whether that be your customers or your suppliers or your employees. I think that's at the heart of what that is. Um, and at MasterCard, in, in my evolution of how I think about inclusion, I see it as a leadership skill, a leadership skill of how leaders are able to build diverse teams as well as sustain them. Um, and so it's not the warm and fuzzy of let's just hold hands and be nice to each other, but it's, it's a competency. And so you know, as, if, if you're going to be a leader in our organization, inclusion is a leadership skill and we expect you to have it. It might look differently at the more junior levels than it does at the senior levels, but there is an expectation of what tangibly the meaning of inclusion means within our organization. Cool. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, I'm going to close it off with Tina and belonging. How do you define belonging? Well, I just want to say, Randall, I so echo what you just mentioned about leadership, and I hope we can delve into that a little bit more. Um, so belonging, you know, when you talk about diversity and inclusion, you hear a lot of DNI, you hear a lot of DEI. Belonging is a, a concept that um, I think we've just, in the past couple of years, or as of late, have, um, have really started to focus more on. And for me, you know, at its core, belonging is a feeling that you are an important member of a group and that you're accepted in that group with all of your differences. And why I think belonging is really important is it's a concept that everyone can understand. Even if you are not part of an underrepresented group, we all know what it's like to not belong, to be that last kid who was selected for the kickball team. At least that was always me. Um, or, you know, what it feels like to not belong to a group that you want to be part of. And I think a common misconception people have around belonging is that they, um, they get it mixed up with fitting in. And belonging and fitting in are two completely different things. Um, you know, when I think back to when I graduated from JMU and I entered the workforce in the late 90s, when I walked through those doors, everyone looked the same. All the men had short hair, everyone was wearing, you know, dark suits. We were all trying to fit in and be similar to each other. We were all trying to assimilate. And I think the great thing about belonging is that you are accepted for who you are and all those great differences. Um, if I walked into my office today, if I were able to do that, what I would see would be a really different picture. And I think what's amazing for all of you students that are listening today is that a lot of things have changed. You know, if I walked into a Google office, I would see someone with rainbow hair. I would walk into a break room and hear someone who's part of the LGBT plus community talking about what they did with their partner over the weekend. That would have not happened 20 plus years ago. So, um, you know, I think belonging is, is important. It's a great entryway into the discussions around DEI. Yeah, on, on that as a follow-up, I, I love uh, that, you know, what you said. So, you know, Vernon Myers, who is most well-known for a number of things, Arthur, but uh, leading diversity and inclusion for Netflix, when she said uh, diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. And that was the two things there. I would add that equity would be given to, to be given the opportunity to host the party and belonging is to hear the kind of music that you can get into and everybody, you know, here's a part of that. So... Uh, I think Vernon started us down a path of really trying to take these concepts and boil them down to, to terms that uh, the average person who may not be in this space could understand. Yeah, I, I love that. And thank you for that. I'm glad that this is being recorded because I'll use that that in my class. Uh, so, so thank you for that. And also, Tina, just to follow up on what you were saying about belonging and this idea of feeling, uh, you know, just recently we were having the, this discussion in my diversity class, right? The difference between sort of inclusion and belonging. And, and, and we all sort of landed on this idea that belonging is really more about this idea of feeling and being able to know that that, that you are almost kind of like at home and, and you, you have the opportunity to just bring your full authentic self and just be. So, so thank you for that. Um, so moving on, I want to go to, to our next question. So the next question is one that I would like for you all to answer. 
And, and what I'm going to ask is, I'm going to ask Brian to, to lead us off in answering this one. So the question is, how did you all get involved in doing DEI work? And also as a follow-up, thinking about this idea of given the complexity, given some of the difficulties that we sometimes encounter in terms of doing this diversity work, how do you guys keep, your, keep yourselves motivated? What, what's that why that keeps you going? Yeah, no, no, I, you know, I, I, I would flippantly answer, I think I was born into it, and specifically because uh, my passion for the topic is tied to my upbringing in South Central LA, which we spoke about it in, in the intro, where, you know, we were uh, severely socioeconomically challenged, to put it uh, mildly. Uh, the top three professions uh, in my neighborhood and in my area were drug dealing, gang banging, and pimp, and that was what people aspired to do, not because they weren't smart, because that was all that they could see and that was the opportunities that were given to them. Uh, but due to the, my family and the love of my family and everybody investing in me, I was able to take a different path than the vast majority of my friends who didn't see their 18th birthday on earth or uh, non-incarcerated, which you know in, invariably ends, ends life for, for you, if you would. Uh, but my path took me to you know, UCLA where I got the math and computer science degrees and actually you know, started a career that's changed the outcomes not only for myself, but my family and hopeful generations of Reeves to come. That said, during my career as an engineer, I always remember where I come from. I remember where I come from today. And my side hustle was always doing things around the DEI area, which is really looking to give opportunity to those who wouldn't normally have it so that they can change the trajectory of their lives. So that became super important. And about five years ago, uh, Bill McDermott gave me that opportunity. I pivoted from being, you know, the software development guy uh, into, to, to, you know, to the side hustle became the main hustle. Uh, and two years into that, that's when uh, Michael Dell gave me this great opportunity to do it at Dell Technology. So net, net that, you know, it is ingrained in me that, you know, for, for like, like anything else, um, you know, I need to give back. I need to sort of, you know, I've been put on this earth to maybe help others uh, achieve way beyond what I would ever uh, do. Uh, so, so that's sort of a mixture of the answers for both of those. That's what keeps me motivated. There are those before me who, who I stand on their shoulders and my hope is others have earned the right to have them stand on mine moving forward. Beautiful, thank you, thank you. Rachel, what about you? Sure, um, so I, I mean, uh, shared a little bit about this um, when uh, Dr. Busing was introducing me, but I, um, I it was around my mid twenties where I, you know, to be honest, there were a lot of things that I was blind to um, and started to sort of realize as I continue to grow in my career, grow as a person, grow professionally. And so, you know, I'm, I'm still continuing that journey of unlearning and some of the scales are still falling off my eyes. Um, but I got involved, I was asked to, to help lead an exploratory committee around diversity and inclusion at the time. And so that you know, over the next five years, um, and that was with Merkel, you know, we continued to dig in to really explore um, the norms and the barriers in our, um, in our company. And so, you know, it grew from there. Um, and certainly there were, you know, I'm grateful for the people who have written, um, written some books that, again, really helped me along my journey of, of unlearning um, and to realizing all of the privileges that I have. Um, you know, and so why I do this work, because you're right, it is, it is challenging. Um, and it's, you know, it's easy to get discouraged too, because we have to be in it for the long run. And you have to put sustained effort against it. Um, I mean, ultimately, I, I want to use my time and my talents and my energy in a way that makes the world a better place. Um, and that uses the, the privileges that I do have for the good of others. So levels the playing field, gives them visibility. Um, and so, you know, I, I want to help change some of these patterns that are really deeply rutted in our society. Um, and I'll be honest too, marketing students, close your ears or don't. You know, I have at times questioned, why do I work in the field of marketing and advertising? You know, what are kind of the pros and cons and what is the, the societal impact uh, the marketing and advertising has on us? Um, however, I think there is so much power in marketing and advertising to change perceptions, to change hearts and minds. And I think we're seeing so many companies putting their dollars and their efforts behind that in a way that is bringing out the good in society and, and that is pushing this as well. So I'm, um, when I was at once sort of discouraged and questioning if, the, if this was the right field, I'm even more convinced that we need people working from within every single field 
to change it from the inside out. And so I'm also so grateful for the people who, you know, aren't doing DEI as their full-time job, but they're doing it through their account work, through how they do media planning, creative, et cetera. And I think that's critical. Love it. Love it. What about you, Randall? Uh, well, it's kind of interesting because the uh, I, I actually was going to get out of doing this work. Um, I, I've been doing it almost, as I said, about 20 years, but I, I would say the first five years of that, um, and it, at, at that point, you kind of have to wonder, is this something that you want to do? Because I really didn't see how my work was being impactful, quite honestly. Um, and we were doing the right things. And I can tell this, I was at Starwood Hotels at, the, at, the, at that time. We were doing the right stuff. We were doing the surveys. We were going to the dinners. I was in the paper. I would do my little speeches. I would get in front of like the right folks and say stuff. But at the end of the day, I didn't feel like I was being fulfilled because I didn't feel like I was moving the needle. Um, but what actually made me passionate about the work is uh, at the time, the CEO called me into his office and said, I want you to blow this thing up and put it back together again. And that's when I drew my passion around the work is uh, because he, he said, put it back together again, stop just cutting and pasting the US on a global model, make it truly global, make it impactful, make it relevant. And so what drives me for this is that I can sit around a leadership table um, and be relevant and be impactful and have some type of standing in those meetings as, as opposed to just saying, okay, there's a diversity guy, he's gonna come in, uh, but really being brought into the fold and having um, the opportunity to even make this a board level discussion and conversation because it's the right thing to do as well as it makes good business sense. Um, and I think the underpinning for all of that for me, as Dean Busing had said, you know, being a black gay man from the South with a white husband, that informs how I make decisions in my role. And so that's kind of the, the why and the how that I do things. Awesome, thank you. And Tina? Yeah, so for me, you know, I spent over 20 years in business and, you know, most of that time my focus was on making money and helping my company make more money. And, um, you know, I, I think a few years ago I was just chasing purpose. I needed more purpose in what I was doing. I had already been um, leading a business women's network at SAP and, um, you know, I watched on the sidelines for years around, you know, what was happening around DEI efforts. And, and finally, you know, threw my hat in the ring and said, you know, I think I can affect some change here. Um, you know, not performative DEI or, or, or just from a marketing standpoint, but really changing. And so, you know, when you ask, you know, what keeps me motivated, I think partially for me, it's numbers, seeing those numbers grow because that feels great. But more than anything, it's, when someone that you've been working with on a program comes to you and says, you made a difference in my life. Like I feel seen, I see people who, um, I, I see myself represented now, or I got a promotion because of the, the coaching that we're working on. To me, that's what makes all the difference. Awesome, love it. And, and, I, and I truly appreciate you all telling your stories because what, what I tend to find is that, you know, there is always some sort of personal component in terms of, of really this idea of people wanting to make a meaningful impact. And that is very personal in terms of wanting to, to do this work and continuing to do this work. So thank you for sharing these stories with us. Um, my next question is, so, so often people say that they can't find diverse applicants. I'm curious to know, what, what are your thoughts? on that and what do you do in your respective organizations to ensure that that you do have that diverse pool of applicants that you can have that diverse workforce and i'm going to start with randall on this one so so if i had a headline i would say if people say that they can't find diverse talent you need to look harder and think differently quite honestly um you know, they're, you know, we're at a war for talent and, you know, the diverse, and especially in this market, I think it's a very unique time to talk about diversity and, and finding pools of diverse talent um, because they're out there. Just because your location specifically might not have a high concentration of diverse talent, market analysis will allow you to figure out what your, your fair share of a certain group is. Uh, but as we work remotely, as we have flexible working hours or working situations, 
um, I think this is a great time for us to flex that muscle within organizations to find that talent um, that you that you need, um, not just because you want a Benetton ad, but because of the perspectives bring to the, uh, that are brought to the table. That. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I have, uh, I'm with Randall, it, you know, again, as a mathematician, it's just hard. I think it's intellectually dishonest to believe that there aren't enough diverse candidates. Because, you know, if you really look at it, in a world of 7.7 .7 billion plus people, I can guarantee you that there's enough diverse talent in this world with the will to have the types of jobs and careers we all have and the opportunities that we all have. It's just that we as an industry have not expanded our aperture to empower those with the will with the necessary skill. So that's the game, right? And as Randall said, and it makes the, the business, and that's why the business imperative has to be there. Some people are zero sum game. If I give to someone else, then you've taken from me. So the, you know they'll come up with words like meritocracy and they're not there. And let me look at what the US said about availability, but it, it, you know, it, it is not true because that, that will is there. And if you can tie the fact that you need this talent because there aren't enough of the one demographic you were looking at to better business outcomes, be their accretive, you know, sort of revenues uh, are accretive uh, margins due to employee engagement and retention. The revenues are accretive because of, uh, of greater innovation. Then, then the game sort of changes. And I think we're going to talk a bit about why, you know, what, that, what that looks like later. I think, I think you also, you know, putting accountability measures in place. So absolutely, you can look harder and find a ton of great talent that's not necessarily a guarantee that your hiring managers will make those decisions. You know, I think there's still a default where people kind of instinctively trust people who look like them, have similar experiences. So I think it's education, it's accountability, very like how is the entire hiring and interviewing process designed that can either support the type of majority culture you have, or that can support an inclusive and equitable process. So I think it's everything from where you look to how you structure and the the measures in place for how you actually make the offer. So I am curious to know, like, what are some of those measures that specifically you all may actually look at in terms of making sure that you are keeping folks accountable? Uh, well, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, go. Uh, uh, so, so I mean, I was going to make a la uh, another comment to your please. your last question um, around you know can't find the talent. I, I think sometimes organizations and and I work with my organization to do that and we, we you know we have the dialogue around what's your employee value proposition why should someone want to work for your company <laughs> so it's like why should women want to work for your company why should LGBT people want to work why should black or Hispanic or white guys want to work for your company and I think it goes into the value proposition of doing that I think that's first and foremost I think the um the metrics that you use are, you know, of, of the, the gene generic things that we all know around slates, uh, hires, uh, retention, uh, engagement, uh, you know, promotion, um, access to leadership development programs. All of those are metrics that show that everyone's getting through the pipeline or through the system. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's one of those things where you, you want to be the employer of choice for best talent. And we know that best talent comes in many different wrappings and is not just one. And so we're here to make sure we're finding best talent, which, which comes in different flavors. Yeah, I, I would add to, to Rana, if you wouldn't mind, and, and I think Rachel was saying it earlier, is the, the, it, at least I think success for, for many of us doesn't come, and Randall did it earlier, from just sort of augmenting what was there. It, you have to take a step back and, and pretty much you know, break fix. You got to break it all and then reassemble it. So I think of it as the entire talent continuum that needs to be addressed from even the STEM investments we make in future talent through to where do you go to engage, uh, you know, sort of the, the talent and the strategies and tactics are out there. How do you interview that talent, you know, the slates and, and all of that? How do you onboard that talent? How do you ensure that they are developed and they have upward mobility? All of that is what this looks like. Because there, you know, to Rachel's point, there's a lot of companies that would be very, very happy to prove you wrong. They'll go to an HBCU or an MSI, they'll recruit, and then they'll be happy when they fail so they can point back at it and say, see, they, they weren't successful. When in essence, they didn't do the right amount of work and they didn't put the strategies and tactics in place to ensure like everyone else that there could be a path to success. So 
uh, job descriptions. There's just so many things that have to be inspected and potentially reinvented uh, for there really to be some, going back to the word equity and opportunity in a company. Awesome, awesome. So, so like speaking a lot along this line of like recruitment, selection, retainment uh, of your employees. So oftentimes like, you know, we definitely hear this associated with HR. And I am curious now, now that, that we've kind of like, you know, got, gotten into that. What exactly, because some of you actually are like chief diversity and inclusion officers. What exactly is your relationship with your HR functions and your re respective organizations and how do you all play, play along with one another to make sure that, that you are get, getting that diverse workforce and the yeah. best talent? You know, what I'll share with about my role at SAP that I loved was leading diversity and inclusion for a board area. I reported into the business. It was a business imperative that DEI was part of our strategy. And so, you know, for me, that, um, that was a great place to be because I had access to so much more and, you know, access to our leaders, which sets the tone. Our leaders make the decisions about who's in, who's out, who's hired, who gets the next cool project. So, for me, having that, um, that straight line to the business was really important and also having partnerships with HR. But um, I think it says a lot when a business says, we want to own this and, um, and drive the strategy around DEI. Yeah, we are, oh, apologies. You're fine, go ahead, Rachel. Um, I was going to share previously DEI for us was in HR. It's now moved to be directly under the CEO um, for a lot of the reasons Tina just mentioned. And, you know, it's not only about your talent acquisition or talent development strategies. There's a ton of client collaborations. And how are we transforming the work that we do? What is racist about the way we do media planning and the way we design creative, um, even the way we analyze data? So, um, it is critical, like I have a shared project plan with my talent acquisition partners in HR, same thing with talent development and the learning programs we put together. So HR is absolutely critical. Um, and I think it's about them embedding this into their regular ways of working, along with us in DEI, helping consult and collaborating um, on key things, especially like education, learning, and again, the types of checkpoints and processes that we put in place together. And to piggyback on that, I think the, 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 the piece that I'd like to stress is that I don't think it's an HR exercise. It's, it, it is part of it, but it's not um, the totality of the work. And I think about it in three buckets around, you know, how do we find the best talent? How do we become the brand of choice or, um, or uh, you know, marketing of choice for, for communities? Uh, and then the other pieces around becoming the partner of choice and how people see your brand in their community. And so mm -hmm. it, it, it flows through all of those pieces. Um, I sit in um, on, on our, I directly report into our general counsel. Um, so I sit on that leadership team as well as our HR leadership team. So there's a very close partnership, uh, but also have connections into the board of directors as well as the CEO. So it, it's seen all over the place. Um, but that's how important um, our organization um, looks at the work and not trying to pigeonhole it into one thing. Um, and as I've, I've reported into HR, but it's an interesting dynamic when you're not and you get a chance to look across the entire landscape of the organization. And I add the same. I report into our vice chairman and our CEO, Jeff Clark, with a very strong relationship to HR. I view the, the two differences, and there's no disrespect because both of them are needed, is there's a run the business with HL, HR provides scale. I mean, that's what they do. They face off uh, as HRBPs and, and, and many other aspects of it. But DE&I and I is a change the business. It's a, as much of, as I was as an engineer, I think of myself as actually an engineer trying to solve a, a much more complex business problem because human beings are much uh, harder to deal with yeah. than machines. Um, so I do think, now that said, a lot of, uh, of my peers do a report into HR and there's some inherent challenges and, you know, but that comes with that because you become a piece of a people philosophy or a piece of a people strategy as opposed to something that is as important to the business as any type of innovation that you put out. So that, that is, I think that's beginning to change, uh, hopefully, 
Um, and again, both all are needed, but, uh, but you know, if it's subservient, it, it's hard to move things forward at times. Thank you. And, and I definitely appreciate you guys expanding the, 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 the actual, I guess, responsibilities of what all you, you all do. It's like you're really, truly touching all various pieces within your various organizations. So again, as you said, it's not just about the HR and the people. It's about really, truly merit recognizing and maybe making sure that your organization is really kind of like, you know, the front and center for, for choice for your consumers and, and whatnot. And really also making sure that you are sort of like, you know, holding hands with, with your fellow community and, and it really sort of like, you know, working hand in hand with them. So, so thank you for that. One, one thing that, that, that I do want to say is like, you know, obviously we are in this pandemic and so part, I'm wondering, like, you know, what have you guys seen in terms of some of the challenges that maybe you might be experiencing in terms of your personnel, in terms of motivation, whatever the case may be for various populations, be it females, your underrepresented groups, uh, LGBTQ, et cetera. Have you seen anything happening within your various industries that you can perhaps speak to? Tina, I'll lead off with you if that's okay. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, not just with the pandemic, but I, I think everything that's happened in our world and especially in the United States since the murder of George Floyd has really, for me, I've seen a seismic shift in the DEI space. Um, I would say pre that time, there was so much focus on gender. Um, a lot of the commitments that you'll see from a lot of the organizations are, are very gender focused. And I think that was because it was easy for people to talk about gender. Um, and I think for a lot of organizations, you know, leaders were really uncomfortable talking about race and a lot of them still are. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of the leaders who have stepped forward and, you know, opened up a space for their non-white team members to talk about um, their experiences. And, um, you know, I, I think we're making s seismic strides um, in the past year that we wouldn't have made if it wasn't for, um, you know, a lot of very unfortunate events. Um, you know, I, obviously there are impacts to all different types of groups. Um, we're seeing women leave the workforce and droves as people need to make a decision. Who's going to take care of the kids? Um, who's going to be in charge of homeschooling? Um, I've also seen so much more of a focus on psychological safety and wellness, which is so wrapped into this DEI topic as well. Um, you know, I, I, I'm hearing more and more wellness um, issues than we've ever heard before and people are being so more so much more vulnerable so so many changes that I think we've seen from from all of the recent events awesome anything to add to that that you guys are seeing well I mean I, I think for the, the I think she I think Tina you you put it eloquently I think the only other piece that I'll add to that is just the um the engagement of overall employees. Well, when COVID first happened, before George Floyd, it was around engaging our employees and making sure that they felt um, just connected in a unconnected environment. And so, so we we did Zoom, um, you know, parties and clubs and stuff like that. I mean, that's who we are as Mastercard, and so that my team helped support with that. Post George Floyd, it was around you're remote, this tragic thing happened, and now people are in the streets and on top in a pandemic, and how do you make sure that these people feel like they're being heard? Um, and so what we had to do is we went out to groups within our organization, especially within the Black community, and said, how can we support? Um, how? Because I, I didn't want to go in with my canned response it's, it's going out to the employee and saying, what will uh, make sure, what will make you feel like the organization really understands what you need and, and what you're going through? And so we had hosted dialogues, we call, I mean, the hardest thing that I have done, and I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of nods, is the night before hosting a global all-employee meeting and moderating a conversation on race. 
I mean, that was the hardest thing that I have ever done. I mean, having board members calling you, having the CEO um, calling you on your personal phone, that never happened until last year. And so the amount of um, pressure that was put on our groups and our teams, it should have been because we should be able to, to triage and help with that. But it, it was an interesting journey that um, I, will, I will never forget. And I think um, many organizations were in the same space. No, I, I, I think that to net it for me, because any horrific thing that's happened in history, there are some unintended consequences, many of them negative, And we know with COVID and George Floyd, the negative consequences, but many of them positive. If you look and then you take, you seize the moment. And I would say, if I were to sum it up, you know, when we look at systemic racism, systematic racism, you know, I would argue that systemic empathy, systemic understanding are the things that will combat it. And so if you even go back to, you know, sort of the civil rights movement, it, you know, everybody talks about Dr. King and, and which is rightfully so. But if you look at when he gave his I have a dream speech, that crowd, there were more people that didn't look like me in that crowd. And that's when the movement happened. And that's what happened on post Floyd, uh, George Floyd's killing is people got off the sidelines and got into it. People became more empathetic. And like Randall said, these listening sessions were pretty amazing. And I didn't, I, I was there to help, but we forced our leaders to have those conversations because it's very easy to be in an echo chamber and let a black person talk to other black people. Uh, you know, that, that, that was not what this was about. It was like a listening session. Are you willing to listen and empathetically understand or try to understand? And we'll give you the assets and the resources so that you can better understand them. But if this is your moment to be empathetic and to lead with empathy. And we took the black team members ideas knowing that, you know, the, it's not just about that the black experience it, it, that is significant, but we included the intersectional input from all of our, ER, our 13 ERGs, faith, pride, Latino Connection, all of them, and had them operate on uh, hundreds of ideas that came out of the Black team member conversations. And that's when we came up with our set of actions that we call Standing Strong Together that we have committed to and are holding ourselves accountable to the acceleration, because this cannot be a moment. It has to be a movement. And these things kind of turn into moments. I can tell you over 400 years, many, many different moments that didn't turn into a movement. Mm -hmm. This feels different. This feels yeah. different. Yeah, it does. And I think just going off of what you've all said, and Brian, you were talking about the action of leadership and the presence of leadership. That is what will either make this a continued movement within your company or not. Or if we go back to where we were, this will be a blip and then we go back down. It's not only how did leaders get involved and respond maybe, you know, in the weeks and months after, but what are they doing now? What are they doing to model um, to model, you know, continuing to have these conversations, continuing to hold Ask Me Anythings in town halls, there continue to be events that are still traumatizing and that we need to talk about. Um, how are they modeling just through daily ways of working, um, inclusion and seeing others, how they run meetings, you know, even small things like adding pronouns to email signatures. And Brian, thank you for doing that here. I forgot. Shame on me. Um, and um, yeah, I think that goes through, you know, you originally started asking about the pandemic, how they model wellness, how they talk about openly what they're struggling with, um, the type of boundaries they try to create for themselves. I think it's really critical that we evaluate what the past year, like what habits that has set in us. Um, there have been a lot of good things that have come out of it, but there are some things that we need to be really intentional about how we move forward. And I think leadership plays such a critical role in what the norms will be um, and what people see modeled as reality. And Demetria, going back to an earlier conversation about that, which always bugs me, is that there's not enough talent. Uh, part of the excuse was that, you know, certainly in our company, you know, headquartered in Austin, Texas, large presence in you know, near Boston, large presence in Northern California, managers would say, okay, I, I, I can only recruit from those locations. COVID and our movement, to, uh, our move to remote work changed everything. We now can tap into other locations where pools of underrepresented talent exist, certainly in this country. And I would argue the same as outside of this country where, uh, where it really is socioeconomic difference is the have and the have nots is the black and white of America, right? Uh, because if without, if you're a have not, you have no voice, you have no voice, you have no power. If you have no power, nobody represents you. So, so that has changed all of that. And now our motion around where we recruit and our philosophy is we can go anywhere because we know we can successfully uh, you know, manage and include talent from wherever they are if they choose to be there. 
Thank you. And, and I'm loving everything that you guys just said, because I was actually going to play devil's advocate and ask whether or not you saw, saw this as just kind of like that moment versus the, this movement. So I appreciate the fact that you guys are really sensing and seeing that maybe this time it is different, that, that like, you know, that this is something that will sustain and we will continue to grow and, and, and develop in this. So, so I love this. So I want to move on to um, my next question. So Rachel, I'm going to start with you. And this is going to be one that's kind of like, you know, going to encapsulate our students. So um, how can students or recent graduates demonstrate their readiness to contribute to this inclusive work workspace? And what can we as faculty, as staff here at JMU do to help better prepare our students? And I, I like I like what you're asking. You're not you're not just saying what are corporations doing? I like how you're saying what can students do to demonstrate their readiness and to live this out? Um, and per usual, students are ahead of us and likely doing this much better than we are. Um, but I, I do think it's important to say the workplaces, at least the ones that you want to be in and you want to work at, are making it clear that this is their expectation and their ambition. I think, Randall, you were the one who said, um, this is a new leadership competency. This is the baseline of what we expect from not only our leaders, but all employees. And this is, people need to demonstrate this as they grow. So I think, I think increasingly, this is you know something for you to demonstrate in, both the actions and maybe the questions you ask as you're engaging with potential employers. Again, simple things like even having pronouns on LinkedIn or your signature or you know, asking um, those in a meeting with someone you don't know yet. Um, so I think there are ways that um, just as you would um, with any questions you ask a company when you're interviewing, you know, look up what are they doing and ask them about it. And you know, be genuine, of course, don't just ask a question to ask it, but I think it's important that you start asking and you need to decide for yourself, is this the right culture for me? Is this going to support me? So I think it's you demonstrating, but you're, you're also importantly really sussing out what, that, what the culture of that company is. Um, I mean, I, I think being inclusive at its core is, is slowing down. Um, someone said it's having empathy for others and focusing on their experience, not just your own. And so I think if you think about the many ways that you can do that, that will show through um, you know, and how you interact with anyone. Um, I think the second part of your question was what JMU can do to prepare. Yeah, us as faculty, staff, whatever. What can we do to help our students? Yeah. And... I mean, I think holding events like this, like continuing to, like I've, I've been working with a professor and helping her um, put this in her entry-level business class, have a couple of classes focused specifically on conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I think certainly creating space for these discussions, modeling some of the behavior um, yourself, and, you know, just continuing to encourage students to think through this and um, to have this be a critical part of, you know, how they're going into the workforce. Um, I mean, I think JMU, what I loved about JMU is like you are about the students and it is truly a supportive environment. And I think that's really genuine. And so I think, I think this comes out of it, but I think you all helping to continue to raise this with students in conversation and action, um, you know, is how you could continue to even better prepare them. Awesome. Anything else that anybody want to add to that? Uh, I mean, the only piece that I'll add to that, I think um, it was said in a, in a really nice way. Um, when I think about what the students can do, I think sometimes we always think about the big thing that we have to go and run off and do, like they have the mountaintop experience. And now I, I'm a diversity person. I'm inclusive. I, 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 I see everything as in every moment of the day in your interactions with folks, you're either a headwind or a tailwind to someone feeling included. And so that's walking mm -hmm. down the hallway and saying hello to someone that might not look like you um, to like if you have an opportunity to hire someone, making sure that your team is diverse um, or, you know, making sure that you're open to a different perspective that's not one that you're traditionally used to. Um, that's what you can do, starting right now. Um, I think the university, uh, I, I think JMU, I mean, I have the shirt on. I mean, I absolutely love JMU. I, I, I spent the, you know, a, a very um, interesting part of my life at that school. And I, I think that the two things I would say is embed uh, inclusion and diversity, again, in the leadership curriculum. Um, but I think the most important piece is for the university to um, further demonstrate that diversity is important by having a diverse faculty and, uh, and staff mm -hmm. that emulates what we want our students to do. Um, and so those are the, the, the few things I would add. 
Thanks. Fully agree that last one, Randall. I, I, uh, I now sit on the advisory board for Carnegie Mellon as well as that Georgia State, and that's that's their challenge. They understand it. They're leaning into it. There are more universities. I think CMU just, uh, I know they just hired a head of diversity and inclusion. So that's a motion that looks well because you need someone like we have in our corporations watching it every day, like yourself, Demetri, you know, holding people to account. The other one, and, and this might be controversial, is there's the, you know, the, the changing the culture of, of a university and replacing, I hated freshman seminar, whatever that class was at UCLA that wasted your time. It would be great to have. Uh, you know, diversity and inclusion training and or foundational learning in, in many of these little spots that uh, and get credit for it. But I also think it's in the relationships with universities. So that diverse talent, once that talent is, you know, open and, and aware and to the point that Rachel was making, that they ask lots of questions with us. We as academic, uh, we as industry wanted to, to work more closely with you. We do with some universities. We are in the classroom with you because with that diverse talent and all talent, we want to teach them the very relevant things and certainly for diverse talent that will give them that unfair uh, advantage, which is sometimes needed because of bias and other things that happen where we break our processes down. So I would say that partnership between academia, industry, and quite honestly, uh, government needs to be a lot tighter with the end goal, not to be a graduation rate, but a placement rate so that these kids really, really, really can change uh, the trajectory of their lives. So, um, so that's one that's challenging. Some schools don't wanna hear it, some professors don't want to hear it, but I think we all have a role to play with the student at the center and, the, and their upward mobility at risk or at advantage. And Demetria, I just want to go back to something that, that Rachel touched on, which is, you know, for the students that are on this call, you know, you might have interviews coming up or, you know, next year you might be interviewing um, for full-time positions. And, you know, I recently went through a job change where I was interviewing with different organizations and I knew part of what I wanted in a culture was a company that had strong DEI. And so, you know, some things to think about as you're interviewing with these companies, do your research, um, look and see if they have an annual report on diversity and see not only their numbers, but what types of initiatives they have going on. Um, search news, see if they've had any big celebrations or big controversies that you should know about. If you go to Glassdoor, you can read all kinds of, you know, background information about companies as well and see, you know, what types of comments people have made. I'd also say look at the executive board and the leadership team. Do you see yourself reflected? Um, before I took my offer at Google, I, you know, thought about, okay, what's important to me in culture? I'm the mother of two kids. So I, when I received my offer, I said, okay, I'd like to talk to someone on the team who is a mother. And I wanna to talk to them about their experience. So I you know, get that understanding of what I might be walking into if I accept the offer. So ask the questions for sure. So you know what you're getting yourself into. And then once you get into that company, um, there's so many different opportunities. If it's a big organization, chances are they have employee resource groups or employee network groups that you can participate in. And that is an amazing opportunity for early talent to get in and show leadership skills. Um, some of the most energetic and um, best programs I've seen have been led by early talent. And then if you're joining a small organization that does not have ERGs or ENGs, you can start them yourself. So so much uh, for JMU students to do. And this, I, I know the heart of JMU students and I, you know, I love seeing all of these people on this call today. So I, I think, you know, maybe we have some, some future people joining the industry. <laughs> Demetra, I, I, I gotta say this because I, I coach um, a few people um, lately and, and typically some of them are probably about three or four years older than this crowd um, of students. And I know that it's really important for them to have, you know, a leadership team that reflects them and, and things like that. But the reality is, in many cases, they're not going to see someone that looks like them in all places. And so I, I've seen where uh, some diverse talent has skipped out or have asked me, should I take a job that's like paying a really good salary, but it's not reflective of who they see themselves and leadership, and I'm like, you better take that job because jobs don't come by that easy. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things, 
is your career in your career. I mean, even at JMU, I can't say that there were a lot at the time, there were a lot of people that looked like me, but it was a great experience because I was an outlier and being sometimes an outlier allows you the opportunity to get certain things that you typically would not get. And so I don't want diverse students, if they don't see themselves in a company to just say, oh, wait, I, I'm not gonna attend that organization or be a part of that company. I think it's really important for them to think about their career trajectory. If you're smart, no one is gonna get rid of smart talent. Great point, Randall, thank you. Yeah, I, I was actually thinking about that because I, I, I thought to myself is like oftentimes I have been in the situation where I was the only, you know, and, and so I think that that many people who come from a diverse background, you, you sometimes get used to that. Uh, and well, I don't I know whether or not we right. should get think, used to it. I think Tina's uh -huh. right, though, at the same time. I mean, it's, it's both of the, the pieces mm -hmm. to it. You have to figure out what's best for you, but don't yeah. don't you know, immediately shut yourself down. You have to have a dialogue around what's going to make you most comfortable. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I totally uh, agree. And, and I think that that I, this is why I think I love that we're having this conversation, because oftentimes I feel as though diverse students don't necessarily hear this message to understand that, that like, yeah, you know, we, we are definitely in this changing world. And, and you may actually go to an organization where there might not be a lot, lot that, that, that look like you, but that doesn't mean that things won't change. And that doesn't mean that maybe you might not be the start of whatever that change may be. And, and so just really just kind of like, you know, wanting to put that out there. Um, any other questions before I get, or any other comments on that before I get to the last question? Or where, oh, we're actually at time. So, uh, Mert, I'm going to pass it over to you and see what sort of questions are coming in. And so hopefully you guys have been taking advantage of our chat function and you've been putting your questions out there. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend maybe about 25 minutes or so answering uh, whatever questions you guys have in the chat. And then I'll t take over again for maybe just some final thoughts uh, that I that might want to have. Well, that we may want to have for my panelists. So Mert, I will turn it over to you. What questions have been popping up? Uh, yes, absolutely, Val. Good evening, good evening everybody. Um, and I will actually start with Connor Herndon's question because his question is um, very related to the last two questions that came in. Um, and he's asking, what are some of the things that you guys do within your respective companies to make others feel included? I'm happy to, to do it. Um, so so I, I think that at least for Adel Technologies, what was important for us is to have some foundational learning that would allow us all to be, you know, you, we started with what are these definitions? I think it's very really important to, to have uh, a language that is common because if you say what is inclusion, what is diversity, what is belonging, what is equity, you'll get, you know, you have a room of a thousand people, you get 800 different answers. That said, so we spent a significant amount of time, and this even predates me, in a bunch of D, what we call DNI foundational learning. It started with unconscious bias, but over the years, we talk about microaggressions, we talk about in and out groups, we talk about uh, what privilege looks like. And I, that is foundational to us, and that has been the thing that has helped, at least for those who want to move, to, 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 to position people for the next thing. Then you start layering in, you know, the level of, you know, sort of transparency about where you are, you know, like anything else, you need to know where you are before you can decide where you're going. And then, as many have said before, once we set a set of goals for our particular things, we, we set up some 2030 goals of what we wanted to look like, at least from a number of dimensions, including demographically, and then deconstructed those every year on year until the fiscal year we're in now. And then we put in some operational plans to hold, and all of that was to hold people accountable on a number of levels. And then we measure it. We have this, um, this great uh, survey we call Tell Dell, 98% of the people in the, of the 165,000 do it every year. And we have some, a lot of very prescriptive measurements to, to see how we're moving. And one thing we do is we measure, and, and the leader can't say I'm inclusive, is does your team think you're inclusive? Do your peers mm -hmm. think you're inclusive? And based on what that, you know, that your, your EMPS score is for that team, uh, which is employee net promoter score, you either get coaching if you're way off for a long period of time, something else happens to you. And if you are doing a great job, we, you know, you, you get rewarded as, as such for that more responsibility promotion. So, so we try to create an environment where inclusive to Randall's point, 
inclusion is not an option. It is a leadership competency. And if you don't have that competency, then like any other competency you may not have, you're not fit for that particular role. So that's what we're doing. We're trying to, from ground up, build all of the places and make it who we are, not just something that you do. Hope that helps. Absolutely. Anybody else wanted to chime in? I would. I I agree with everything you said, Brian. Um, I think you know it's it's also taking every opportunity to um, whether it's through events led by the employee BRGs, um, the types of things the company celebrates and does or doesn't communicate about. Um, you know, taking every opportunity to feature people of truly diverse backgrounds. Um, so having, um, you know, we had a, a differently abled person sit with our CEO for a one-on-one -on -one conversation that went out to the whole company. Um, things like that, it's, you know, what do your policies say? Are there assumptions being made? Even, you know, things like alcohol in the workplace or at events and how will that land differently on, on different people? Is there even a policy that, you know, um, people are protected against, you know, some hair discrimination that may happen, people being told, oh, you can't wear your hair like that to a client meeting. So I think there's, it's every opportunity. And I, I really do think it is those daily ways of working that you, do you have an inclusive culture or not? Are you mindful about making sure everyone has opportunity to speak up, everyone is heard, everyone is given the same level of credibility. So I think there's a lot of things that we've um, together, and, and I fully agree with Brian, that education and understanding um, is the foundational part of that as well. Excellent. Um, so our next question is from Glorious, who has a beautiful name. Um, and um, the question is, do you think because of what happened in 2020 with Black Lives Matter movement, that there has been more emphasis on DEI? If so, if the movement did not happen last year, do you think there would be as many conversations statements and emphasis on it in the business world? I'll, I'll try to tackle that. Um, I think there are a lot of organizations that saw um, the events in the tragedy of last year as an opportunity to um, get more momentum on a topic that they've already been working on. Um, I think, in, and I'd like to think that many organizations had inclusion and diversity efforts, but then there was this opportunity to ride the wave for more. Um, and so that's why you saw a lot of organizations saying, we have an inclusion diversity strategy. This wasn't the first time that we're talking about black people in the organization and how we wanted to advance. But as we were just talking about earlier, there was this there was this wave and there was this, there was this momentum and we were all saying it felt differently. And all the organizations wanted to, to tap into that feeling different to make more momentum in that same effort. Um, and so th that's how I would answer that. You know, would it have been the same? It probably wouldn't have been the same because you wouldn't have had that same wave you could ride on. Um, and so I think we all wanted to, to just ride and, and extend work that we were already doing um, with extra momentum around resources as well as um, focus within the company. Yeah, I, I'd lean in exactly, uh, uh, Randall. And, and again, I, I try to be introspective and, and study and, and learn. And sadly, human beings, we tend not to do extraordinary things until we're pushed mm -hmm. or certainly extraordinary things in a direction that isn't natural for us. Uh, going back to, you know, time, you know, I was, I was, I was born in, in the 60s and it took, you know, young girls being killed in a church in Birmingham, Alabama for the, that civil rights movement to, to, to accelerate. Because again, those people in the middle, finally, were, it, it had to be children. It, it's a horrible that somebody wouldn't move uh, off of the middle uh, by saying, you know, adult uh, black men and women, you know, and, and the atrocities that happened to them. But that changed everything in some people's minds and it began, became a movement. I think George Floyd it did that you know, for us uh, in a very similar manner, the brazen away. And then the fact that it was global, it wasn't just people protesting here. I mean, I, I was in LA for Rodney King. I was up the street, I, it was near the neighborhood I grew up in. But people around the world just saw the brazenness of an individual to do this to another individual, the have and have not. So uh, yes, now, What's interesting is I was waiting to see what CEOs were going, who's going to move, who's going to be a first mover. 
And, you know, everybody started making statements. Some folks wait and, and they, they see and what can you get away with. But the bigger thing for me was in Q2 or, or actually it's the Q3 and the quarterly results, you know, you, you sit there and the CEOs or the CFOs and someone else talk about the performance of the business over the quarter in public companies. And there's a stat that said in Q2, there were only 4% of CEOs or whoever was giving the statement that had a racial, any aspect of a racial inequity statement in their quarterly, you know, sort of conversation. It was 40% after George Floyd. So a lot more paid attention. There were all kinds of commitments made. Guess what? They're all up we're about a year almost coming into it. And it's really gonna be, you know, you said this, what did you do? And people are gonna be held account um, for what they said if they didn't do it. Uh, and for those who did and, and, and are continuing, I think that there uh, is a significant amount of upside as a company and perception and value that they'll get Thank you, Brian. Um, our next question is from Allison Colglazer. And her question is, what would you say is the most difficult part of the part of implementing a DNI program? <laughs> yeah, but, uh, we're all coming like uh, just one. <laughs> just <laughs> <everything we're> all. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, one thing I'll throw in there is that everyone comes from different backgrounds and has different experiences, and you don't know what anyone else's experience is. And so, you know, Rachel, you said earlier, changing hearts and minds. Changing hearts and minds is tough when you don't know everyone's experience, especially if you have a global organization that adds so much more complexity. So for me, it would be, you know, trying to meet everybody where they are and give everyone the education that they need to get to that next level. And, and I, I would say the same thing. I, I think I, if I were to do it all over again, I would get a degree in psychology because that's, that's what I do. That's what we all do every day. It, it's not so much the job is hard. It's about uh, understanding the blinders and the filters that people come into the office with um, and the perspectives that they come with, which is a great thing, which I love. <laughs> it's so cute that the little kid came in. Um, uh, so th that piece, the, the other piece is, you know, around prioritization from the leadership team to understand what is the area of focus for the company. And so until you kind of nail that down, what I found with the leadership team around what are the two or three things that we really want to get some traction on, uh, until that happens, it's all over the board. Um, and so we have these lofty goals of doing a lot of stuff, but nothing will get done until you kind of hone in on what are the two or three things that are going to be most important that we can cascade through the organization. Yeah, I'd answer you, yeah, moving that, what you guys told about, moving that frozen middle. You're going to have in a company of whatever size, you know, so it's like a bell-shaped curve. There are people who will never hear this. It's a zero-sum game. I will do whatever because I feel as though you're taking away from me. On the other hand, you're going to have people who, for whatever reason, any intersection of uh, diversity and inclusion they come from, they're going to be your champions. But the vast majority in most companies is the frozen middle. And to all the points that were said, what, you know, how do you get things that resonate with them because they may not naturally um, have an affinity for, for doing things. So that's the toughest part when, when and, and you have so many different intersections and if you're, if you're global like we are, it's, it's, it becomes very, very difficult. But um, having global programs executed locally with all psychology and you know, legal, there's a lot of stuff you can and can't do in certain places. So how do you sort of continue to move that frozen middle? And a lot of it is really tying what we do to the business outcomes. I mean, that, that's one thing most people in a company would agree on is they want to thrive. For whatever reason, they want to thrive. If you can sort of say that being more inclusive, you know, sort of will get you a bigger bonus, that, hey, that's a speech for some people and they'd be all in for, on that one. But you got to find the things that'll move the, the, map, the, the frozen middle, in my opinion. I think... Um... Uh, on top of everything that's been said, I think one of the things that's exciting but also really challenging about um, truly implement, you know, implementing a program and embedding this into your organization is it touches every single part of your process, like all of your processes, the work you do with clients, 
legal, like it's just, there are so many work streams, which um, is exciting, but it's, it's just a lot. And I, um, you know, for, for me, like with my skill set and some of my experience prior to doing this, I do have a role that's actually a little bit more about operationalizing um, what are all the processes and different work streams that we have. So I, I think it's an opportunity for everyone to bring their different skill sets to the table. Those who are great with words and, you know, um, inspire people and give the vision. And then those who can help execute and make these things happen, all the little details that no one will ever see, but that matter um, in, you know, what's the foundation of your company. Excellent, thank you all. Um, we have one other question from Ethan, but I would also um, would like to let everybody know that um, after this, we we'll probably have time for one or two other questions. So if you want to uh, let us know what your question is in the chat, I can um, pick that up as well. So Ethan's question is, when dealing with diversity and inclusion efforts campaigns, do any of you ever perceive this ingenious efforts made by corporations that are simply trying to market appeal to certain groups and individuals, or do you feel that a majority of the efforts are made with the correct intentions? Hmm. I'll throw myself off a cliff if no I'll one else wants right to. Behind you. I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> jump right after you, man. Go ahead. Uh, um, how I would respond to that is you have to, re to, to remember that organizations are um, publicly traded ones have a fiduciary responsibility to their sh shareholders. I mean, it's, it's a business. I, I mean, it's the right thing to do. Yes, and many organizations have a value proposition or a mission statement or, um, you know, how we operate as a company and, and inclusion and diversity is part of that. But I, I think you, you should make no um, uh, misunderstanding that companies are in place to make money for their shareholders. And so what might seem disingenuous or, uh, or, or, or actually part of their value system, it could be either one. Um, it just depends on the, the strategy of that organization of why they're doing it. Many organizations do it because it's the right thing to do, of course. But then there are other organizations that have to really think about is their, is their base or their customer base a diverse group and they need to do something to make sure that they're able to continue their revenue stream, they're going to do it, whether they're diverse or not. Um, and so it, it's both and. I think many organizations on the Fortune 500 are trying to do the right thing because they feel like that, that is the right thing to do. But at the same time, businesses are in place to make money for their shareholders. And, and following that thread, I think the answer is, well, well the, the good news is certainly with regards to what happened last year is we'll see. You, you have the, the beauty of social media, at least one of the, the good ones is you can go back and find out what somebody said and what they did. And I think what you're going to find is there's going to be some mismatches to, to what that is. So whatever those companies are. The other one to Randall's point is, yeah, companies are, that's why I think it's so important to tie this topic to um, business outcomes. So, you know, a couple of statistics. Um, is it pandering or not if you knew that women globally spent over $21 trillion in the world? Well, you know, somebody might think it's pandering. Another one, that's a big strategy. You need to have strategies aligned with women. The fastest growing um, in the U.S. alone, the fastest growing, um, you know, purchasing power groups are Blacks, Asians, Hispanics, and Indigenous Americans. Therefore, you need to have tactics and strategies to go after their share of the purse. Um, so, you know, so I think, you know, the, the, that Randall said, they'll be motivated, but to the degree that if you recognize that your customer base is changing, look at a McDonald's commercial, Super Bowl's coming up, go back 10 years, look at a McDonald's commercial, they're still selling hamburgers and, and such, but look at who they're, they're, they're speaking to in the commercials you'll see this, this uh, upcoming or, uh, Sunday from now. So smart companies recognize that their consumers or the people they're selling to, even if it's business to business, their decision makers are changing and smart companies always change tactics and strategies to meet them. But if, you know, but if you say you're going to do something and you don't do it, there's a come up. So we'll see what happens a, a, a few months from now. Thank you, Brian. 
Um, this next question is from Sydney, and she's asking, even though diversity officer roles and conversations around the issue of diversity are becoming more common in business, do you ever face challenges with companies being resistant to putting energy and resources towards real change? I think, I think you still do. Um, I think it goes nicely after the, the question that was just asked and the thoughts that Randall and Brian added. Um, you know, I, I think it, it most often comes from a lack of understanding. I mean, Brian, you talked about the frozen middle. You know, you, you will find less the people that are actively trying to keep someone else down. Um, but they, they simply don't realize and they don't realize the systemic nature of how all of this is connected and systemic discrimination that so many groups face. And so I think, and I, I think it's helping them to understand the critical business impact that this has as well. They're, yes, they exist to make money and this is critical for making money. You will get, your business will um, perform better financially. You will have better connections with your clients and partners. You will have more engaged, more creative employees. So I do think there's some, you know, there's still some education to be done for some people in really like helping the, the light bulb come on about how everything is connected and how this is the foundation and the lifeblood of their organization rather than something off to the side. I think that the toughest one, if you, again, human nature, if you, if you work for a super successful company um, by whatever definition that, that, you, that you deem it, we are taught that, you know, keep doing the things that made you successful. It's very hard for, for individuals, let alone companies, to disrupt themselves fundamentally. And what DEI does is, is exactly that. Again, a difference between run the business and change the business. And so I think the difficulty is when you have people who are perceptively believe they're doing everything right and they get all of the sensors <laughs> and senses that they are, right? And they're highly profitable and all this. And then you go to them, it's like calling somebody's baby ugly because you, you basically are saying, no, you need to break, fix that thing for this other reason. And people have a hard time sort of suspending disbelief if they don't understand it. So I think that's where some of the challenges come. The conversations I have, people are like, I, I think we're fine. I we're not rich, we're not this, we're not that. All you have to do is, is the words you'll hear. But when you're, you know, changes, you know, change management is tough, 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 tough. And for companies that are broken, yeah, they're ready to look for, for an answer. But for companies or environments where people thought they have great cultures and all that, and you're coming in to say, no, you, you need to do more, it needs to be different. That's what makes at least my, my experience difficult. All right, thank you. Um, and I'll throw it back to Demetria um, with the final question. So before I get to my final, final question, I do have one other question that, that I want to ask you guys, because Brian, you, you sort of mentioned and, and alluded to this idea of unconscious bias and, and really kind of like, you know, maybe starting to get a handle of, on that sometimes with your employees and developing that common language, et cetera. I'm just curious to know what you guys found to be uh, successful as you work towards like, you know, the, these various psychologies of individuals and in working with these biases, what, what have been some of the things that you guys have found that have worked for you all in your organizations? So one thing that, um, that we piloted um, at the end of last year was, you know, looking at how we teach people about inclusion and bias and their behaviors and how you really change behaviors. So can you send someone to a training where they might have some aha moments of, oh yeah, I never thought about that before. And then you send them back to their job and they do the same thing that they always did. So one thing that we've, that we've piloted that has, has shown really good results um, is having an inclusive leadership challenge where we served up micro learnings on inclusive behaviors and then immediately challenged the leaders to use those behaviors. So I'm going to teach you about pronouns in three minutes with a short video, and then I'm going to tell you three things I want you to do right away. I want you to go update your LinkedIn. I want you to commit to talking about pronouns when you kick off your next meeting, etc. And so, you know, what we found from survey results was immediately challenging people to use those behaviors at the moment they learn them, they have a, a better uh, rate of using those behaviors again in the future. 
Ooh, I love that. Yeah. And throw some gamification in um, and some competition. And depending on the type of leader, especially if you're talking about sales, that works. <laughs> I have a little bit of a different perspective on that. Um, just over the years in doing the work, um, what, what we tend to call our experience or training inclusive leadership um, and try to steer away from unconscious bias, that terminology. Um, I, I can only just give you an example of being called into an office uh, of a CEO and say, you're scaring my people. <laughs> it's like you're putting them through this thing. Um, and so uh, what, I, what I learned is that people felt like they were coming in at a deficit and that we had to reprogram them and retrain them. And a lot of people had the glaze over look of I didn't do it or like rattling off their numbers and all this other stuff. So we just called it, it's just another leadership skill, just like financial acumen, just like, you know, ex executive presence, just like all those other skill sets, not to make it scary to folks. Um, because we were scaring the folks, and I've been in three organizations where people were scared when you said the words unconscious bias. Um, maybe it doesn't work for other organizations, but for us, that's what we do. Um, and so th that's that's the way that we approach it is through real life case studies. Uh, that by by calling it something doesn't get you off the hook. I mean, what I'm saying is is that we use data points around what are we getting sued for? What are those ER issues that keep coming up? What are those things that we're finding in engagement surveys that are negative? All of those components, and what does the data look like of, for your area? And using those as the baseline for what we do differently, because it's tangible stuff and you can, you can coach around that. But the terminology, it just scared people and they were not open. And when we just called it leadership skill, that's when they became open to, to listening. Awesome. Thank I think um, in certain applications, like for example, in our interview guide that all of our hiring managers use, it contains everything you need to know for our interview process. It up front, it has a table that that does call out like specific kinds of bias, affinity bias, recency bias, beauty bias, age bias. So I do think that's one example where I fully agree um, with what you just said, where it's a scary topic and it's sort of, it's really difficult to, um, if you go in talking about bias, just generally, um, I think it may not produce the result that you want, but I think, where you do have prompters and resources for as people are making decisions and as it's very applicable to that situation, you can be specific and just help them say, oh, wait, am I, hold on, am I weighing this more heavily than I should? Um, so I, I, I agree with that. And I feel like it's a blend of how you provide resources for people and allow them to control, you know, change their behaviors a bit more. Cool. So it looks like we have five minutes left. So what I want to do is I, I, I want to wrap things up and, and ask each of you to perhaps share something, uh, something tangible, something practical that perhaps, especially our students that, that are on the call, uh, some sort of call to actions that they can actually take with them as they learn to develop the, the skill set of, of inclusiveness, this competency, a, a, as we've actually been referring to it. So I was just curious, and I wanna go with, with each one of you and see what, what might be something that you think uh, they can take away with them to help them build that competency skill of inclusiveness. I'll start with you, Tina. I'll start with Tina. Yeah. So, you know, I would say for the students as they, they go into the workforce, you know, advocate for yourself, go out there, find mentors, high level mentors, don't shoot low, shoot high, um, and be advocates for others as well. So be allies for, for different um, team members. You know, if someone is talked over in a meeting, bring them back into the conversation, like model that inclusive behavior that you would want someone to extend to you. Love that. And mentors and a sponsor. Sponsors make all the difference in, in a career. Totally agree. Uh, Rachel, I'll go with you next. Yeah, I think, um, Tina, very similar to what you just said. You know, think about you know, as, as you're growing your career, as you're building and investing so much time in yourself, think about how you can give other people access and visibility. 
So whatever privileges you have, and education is a big privilege, think about just the, your connections, your situation in life, what you have um, that could be used for the good of others. So as you get into the workplace, even if you're in that entry level role, think about how you can be mindful of your peers. I love the example you gave of um, ensuring people have the right visibility in meetings. Just look for ways to amplify um, the work of others because this is not, this does not have to be a binary situation where it's for you to get ahead, you have to downplay the efforts of others. Um, so I think, you know, slowing down, making time, learning about other people's experiences. Um, I mean, that will, that, that's what makes a difference um, in the world. And that's what we need everyone to think about doing in their own way. Beautiful. Mr. Brian. Yeah, I'd echo it. I mean, you know, I would just say, you know, be the change uh, that, that, you, that you, you hope the world is seeking and, and where you want to be. Um, and Randall had a good one. I have a similar formula every day, I mean, and this has been my formula since I was a very young person. You have an opportunity, uh, to think of yourself as a brand. We, we watch the stock market all the time. You are a stock market, an individual. Every day, you know, your brand can accrete, it can dilute, and worst case, you want it to at least be where it started. And I think having a personal brand around inclusion, uh, around equity, around diversity, around everything that we've talked about is a very, very, very strong brand to have. So be the change. Love that. And last but not least, Mr. Tucker, by the way, you do have a fan out here, Ryan Gavin, that, that I'm seeing in, in the chat. Uh, <laughs> so, hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, there, there are two things. Like, I would tell anyone that I was coaching, if they're just recently a grad, to, to it's okay to make mistakes, just learn from them. Um, because each of us have made mistakes and that's what have gotten us here today to be on this panel is through uh, kind of learning from those, um, those, those growing pains. Um, and then the other piece is around from an inclusion and diversity uh, is just thinking about the missing perspective in everything that you do. If your perspective is narrow, how do you make sure that uh, you're widening it? Um, making sure that, you know, from your friendship base to like your people that you might hire, uh, to where you get your news sources from, all of those things matter. Um, and so just think about having different perspectives because it'll open up a world for you. Awesome, 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 awesome. So we are at the eight o'clock hour, wow, right on time. Um, and words, the, the simple words thank you cannot express enough, I think how I am feeling towards you guys uh, for, for really just showing up being present, giving your full selves, and and share and sharing your stories, uh, we very much appreciate it. Uh, and I'm saying that we collectively, in terms of the College of Business, and as well as our Diversity Council. So again, I just really want heartfelt thank you to, to you guys for taking time out of your schedules to come in and share with us. Uh, to our audience out there, I just want to share with you guys. Remember, this is the first to four, so we have another one, another speaker series coming up next month, February 25th. And the topic for that is going to be recognizing implicit bias and responding to microaggressions. So be on the lookout uh, for, for news about that one and how you can get registered for it. Uh, with that being said, I don't know if there are any final thoughts from our panelists before, before we go. Oh, thank you. What a great moderator. Thank you. Thank you. You've been so gracious and, and thank everybody. But thank you, Dimitri, and thank you, Merton, and the entire team for the opportunity. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It's cool to be with my other JMU grads. I will have to say that. <laughs> oh, man. Now I got to go. Now I got to go. Three. What? Well, uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll send you a shirt. Just I, I, I'll take that, man. Uh, honorary is a good thing. I <laughs> I'll take honorary any day. We got you covered, Brian. <laughs> thank, you so much. thank you. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, thank you guys very much to everybody in the audience. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, again, look for us next month. We'll be back. So have a good evening, all. Thank you. Goodbye.